Sometimes people ask me, how did you become a pastor? And I almost always tell them, I was a reluctant pastor. By that I mean I was running away from God, refusing to obey him and follow him. Maybe not reluctant, maybe resistant is a better word. I was a therapist in a a private counseling setting and things were going well and began to have this kind of uneasy tug in my heart. I would often counsel Christian men and women, and in the course of things, I always had the view and the perspective that as I helped people, they would eventually go back, be a part of their church, and their pastor would become their kind of go-to person in the course of things. I was there just to kind of get them back on track. And often, on more than one occasion, I had people say to me, oh, well, we don't talk about that kind of thing in our church. I'd say, well, that's, that's kind of crazy, isn't it? They say, oh, well, yeah, we don't, we don't talk about that, and you could fill in the blank, whatever that is. We don't talk about divorce in our church or people with anxiety or anger. It's not okay to talk about addictions in our church. And I just think that is just utterly, absolutely crazy of all places, the church should be the most safe place to be real. It should be the most um, magnetic place to be vulnerable. There should be this kind of compelling reality that we're all fellow strugglers and we can encourage one another as we move along. And so God began to use this uneasiness in my life in 1994, 95, and um, I carved away some time, went away, got quiet, basically said to God, what do you want from me? God said, I I want you to take your skill set and I want you to move inside the church. And I said, are you sure about that? I was a reluctant pastor. And it took me months and months to be honest. I'll never forget coming home and saying to my wife, because she knew this was going on, and she said, what did, what did you feel like the Lord said? I said, well, I think God wants me to become a pastor. And my wife said, I'm not ready to be a pastor's wife. <laughs> and so over the course of meeting with people and getting some counsel and so forth, I finally just, I gave in. And I said, God, I told you a long time ago, wherever you want me to go, whenever you want me to go there, and whatever you want me to be or do, that's what I'll aim to to accomplish. And so I threw my hands up in the air, and in the course of things, God led me to this church in 1995. I was a reluctant pastor. But my sole desire in making the transition was I wanted to be a part of helping create or construct or lead an environment, a church, where it was okay, it was safe, it was real, it was authentic. The power of God's word really wrestled with and applied to genuine problems and issues in people's lives. That was always my core longing. That's why I'm here. It's why I keep coming back. This now my 19th year. Why are you here? What is it about this church that has you say, I want to be a part of this place? What draws you? Is the craving for something real and safe and transformative in the mix for you? I pray it is. Today I want to talk to you about the vision of community church. And specifically, we're going to talk a little bit about some strategic visional pieces that we've been working on for the last couple of years. If you're here as a visitor, if you're new to Community Church and you're wondering, what is this church all about? You have picked a fantastic Sunday to be here because you have a chance to kind of watch the church open the hood of the car and talk about the details of what's going on. If you want to know what it means to be a a part of this church, this message and the one that follows two weeks from now really aim to paint some of the specifics so you know this is a church I want to be a part of or, or not. And that's okay too. 
You won't have to wonder what we're aiming for. So let's pray, ask God to speak, and fill our time with his presence. God, we have been led into your presence by song and prayer, and we have sensed your spirit here in a way that's good, it's, it's disarming, it's comforting. And now, Father, we want your word to stir in us in a way that it equips us, that it, it makes us a little uncomfortable. God, we want to be taught by you. Use your word and the things that you've been working in the hearts of the leadership of this church over these last couple of years to equip all of us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. At Community Church, we embrace the idea that we don't get to come up with the purpose of the church. That is, when Jesus was walking on planet Earth and teaching and speaking and, and training his disciples, he defined the purpose for his people. So we don't get to just make that up. Our job is to discover it in the, in the scriptures and the teachings of Jesus and then embrace that and apply ourselves to it. In a community church, we think that you can find the purpose of the church in two key passages where Jesus makes overarching, overwhelming kinds of statements. It's called the Great Commandment and the Great Commission. We've talked about this over the years. Matthew 28 is the Great Commission, and Matthew 22 is the Great Commandment. Let's talk about the Great Commandment first. Jesus is being questioned by a Pharisee, an attorney, who's trying to trick him. They love to debate about the law. And uh, what's the most important law? And what are, the, what are the first, second, and third laws? And so this attorney comes to Jesus and tries to trick him. Matthew 22, verse 36. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, this is Jesus answering, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. There's two simple parts to Jesus' answer. What's the most important commandment? Jesus said, love God with all your heart, soul, mind. Another uh, passage says strength. The whole of who you are. We say around here, be a wholehearted follower and love your neighbor as much as you care about yourself. Imagine this. The, the Pharisees are debating and deliberating about the law for eons and Jesus summarizes all of the, the Old Testament, all of the law in four words basically. Love God, love others. This is called the great commandment. Love God and love others. Love God with passion, with your whole being. It's not about going to church per se. It's about understanding who Jesus is and what he did on your behalf and following him and surrendering to him and obeying him in every way. Making him the center of your life. And there's that transforming power that happens when you love God that way. And then being so compelled by your experience that you aim to love others the way you've been loved. To care about people as much as you care about yourself. To get in connection with other people. Community Church, we embrace the great command, love God and love others. We also embrace what's called the Great Commission. Jesus' final words, his marching orders for his people before he ascends into heaven and all eternity. Matthew 28, verse 18, Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always, even 
to the end of the age. The single most important word in those verses is the word go. Go, therefore, and make disciples. The most important word is go. Christian people, according to Jesus, are people who gather and people who scatter. Go, be the church, we often say here. They reach out to others. Christian people are are notoriously concerned about the empty chairs, about the neighbor, about the person who can't do for themselves. Go. And while you're going, make disciples of all nations. This isn't just a a command for Fond du Lac or even for Wisconsin or the United States. This is a, a command for the world. Wherever God gives us opportunity around the world, we're to be people who go. These kind of people know what's going on in the world. It bothers them when they see what's happening in their neighborhoods, their communities, their state, country, and the world. God's gathered church, that's what church means, the gathered ones, scatter and they go out. These are the marching orders of the church. And while you're going and making disciples, Teach them all that Jesus commanded. Teach them to know how to obey him, how to follow him, how to honor him. It doesn't come naturally to people. We must be taught. This is universal. We believe every church should obey the great commandment and the great commission. We don't get to define the purpose of the church. God defined it for us. Now, what Community Church has done in taking and understanding and deliberating about the Great Commandment and the Great Commission is we have put this in our own contextualized words, what we call our vision statement. And we say it this way. It's on the front of your bulletin. We aim to become a movement of disciples radically committed to loving others for the glory of God. It would profoundly stir the heart of your pastor if all of you knew that phrase by memory. And and more than just being able to regurgitate it, that you would own it, that you would desire to live that out, to become a movement of disciples radically committed to loving others for the glory of God. There are four parts to that vision. Last fall, I taught on this vision statement. So I'm just going to kind of work through it quickly, but if you want more depth to it, um, you can go to last September's message, and you can see how I deliberated about that. By the way, it's kind of funny. This is the the dilemma dilemma of video. I I had looked at my notes several times to make sure I didn't repeat too many things, and this morning I thought, I'm just going to watch the opening introduction, and I wore the exact shirt I'm wearing today. I don't know what that means. My wife might burn this shirt today. We'll see how it works. But There are four parts to that vision. We want to be a movement of disciples. We love that word movement. We use it on purpose. A movement is sometimes messy. It's alive. It's organic. It's not always easily directed. It, It... works in people's living rooms and where they work and across their backyards and in the relationships that they have. A movement of disciples. It crosses generations. It engages messy people. It aims to help anyone, wherever they're at, grow into the likeness of Christ. If you like church to be neat and clean, people always dressed conservatively, with a minimum of tattoos and piercings, you might find this unsettling. If you always want to sit in the same place, that's your chair, that's your row, you might find this bothersome. A movement of disciples means we're willing to adjust our lives for the betterment of other people. But if you like messy life, authentic, real, transformative experience, You've found the right place. It's part of why we love to do the faith stories around baptisms here. 
People just saying, oh, I once was a mess. And here's some of that story. And I didn't deserve it, but God found me and, and his love changed me. And while I'm not perfect, man, I'm now on a journey. We love to see and hear and tell those stories over and over. We aim to be a movement of disciples. We aim to be a movement of disciples radically committed. We selected that word radical on purpose. Christians who follow Jesus are not casual people looking for just a little religion on the side of the plate that's already full. Jesus is not parsley. Christians who follow Jesus are radically moved are deeply stirred and changed, and they cannot help but respond with the whole of their life. They live with what some call a wartime mentality. In peacetime, you know, you can kind of do whatever you want to do, but when, in wartime, you must marshal your focus and your resources, your energies, to battle, to do what must be done in order to take the hill. Radical commitment means you see the brevity of life and you want to make your life count. Jesus calls for radical, wholehearted devotion from his followers. This church aims to be a high-commitment, high-challenge church. It might make us uncomfortable. People who are radically committed are all the time making prioritizing value decisions. What do I do with my resources in the, in the context? What do I do with my time in the context of the challenge? We want to be a movement of disciples radically committed to loving others. This radical commitment is aimed at people. We want to have a radical commitment to love other people. One of the early realities of the church was that it cared for the people who weren't in their circle. The way we say it around here is the empty chairs bother us. We're concerned about the people who aren't here. Many of you were not here two years ago, five years ago, ten years ago. And there was a crowd of people before you who prayed for you, who labored for you, who worked and donated and did a variety of things so that you could sit in the chair that you now sit in. This is a love that marks people. To be loved so completely by God, so thoroughly and so powerfully, causes a, a change in the interior of your life that says, I want to share that with someone else. Somebody else who maybe is where I was needs to know what I've discovered. It always starts this way in the Christian life. I had the opportunity this week to visit with a guy completely disconnected, unchurched, never come into this building, hasn't been to church in years and years and years. He was in dire straits. The church was able to help him so that he would not become homeless. And I just wrote him a simple note in the card when I gave him the check and just said, in case you didn't know it, God loves you. That simple message needs to be told to thousands and thousands and thousands of people right here in our neighborhoods, at our workplaces. We aim to become a movement of disciples radically committed to loving others for the glory of God. This means that we recognize that the ultimate purpose in life, the reason you exist, the, the reason God gave you breath to breathe is so that you might live for him. The reformers talked about sola de gloria. Uh, for the, the glory of God alone, we live for the glory of God. Everything Everything comes back to him. This is our vision. This is our broad, overarching sense of purpose. It's our explanation. It's our DNA of the great commandment and the great commission. To become a movement of disciples radically committed to loving others for the glory of God. 
This mandate, we believe, is given to community church. It's not my vision. It's not the elder's vision. This is God's vision for us. Now, what I want to share with you briefly now is the strategic implications of that vision. We have for several years now been working on a number of different ventures trying to develop how can we accomplish that vision more effectively in any number of areas. To be a movement of disciples means we want to reproduce disciples. We want to reproduce leaders and we want to reproduce congregations. Reproducing disciples, leaders, and congregations. And one of the things that has become very clear in the last two years is that as a church, we have lost our ability to explain the good news of Jesus Christ clearly and succinctly in the relationships that we have. In some of our internal research, uh, the information that you have filled out, it appears clear that we're not very good at this. To raise high the hope and the love of Jesus and explain with our mouths clearly what it means to be in relationship to God through faith in his son. And as leaders, we have said, this is not okay. Like, like that's got to change. We've got to figure out some things so that we can get much better at explaining the love of God to other people. This is why we have developed the Legacy Path Summit that we unveiled last year, our first ever summit in February, and we have another one coming this next February. It's our effort to say to parents, can your home be the incubator of spiritual life and growth and uh, formation? Can you first learn to share your faith right in your home, right with your kids, family life? Can your home be marked by Christian faith? Families need spiritual direction. We want the home to be an incubator. Your first evangelism is in your own house. Parents modeling biblical truths and making sure that their kids understand them. The statistical reality that a significant and alarming majority of kids grow up in church they get out on their own when they're old enough to make the choice to go or not go. It's like 80% don't go. And that's not okay. We're falling down in the fundamental making it clear at home. And this is why we've launched so the Legacy Path Summit. This is why we now launched the Gospel Project, which began today. We've embarked on an entirely new children's ministry curriculum that will help kids understand the whole of the Bible through the lens of faith in Jesus. And then David has organized that parents and adults can walk through and understand the Bible themselves. You can't explain that which you don't understand. This is a fantastic opportunity for adults who maybe have never read the Bible or don't feel like you understand it well. The Gospel Project is going to give our students and our children and students an opportunity and adults an opportunity to understand the whole of the Bible in the course of the year. If you haven't seen it, down this hallway here is a map that marks Genesis to Revelation in a simple pictorial format, and you can see the whole of the Bible. We want to reproduce disciples and leaders starting in the home first and moving beyond. In two weeks, I'm going to talk specifically about the kind of newly defined, simplified strategy which we have been working on for about really a year and a half or better. You saw it on some of the screen material. We'll talk about it in two weeks. Connect, grow, serve, repeat. More on that in two weeks. I said we want to reproduce disciples. We want to reproduce leaders. We also want to reproduce congregations. This church has a long history of church planting, it's in our DNA. If you hang around here for any length of time, it starts to infect you. you. We've developed all kinds of vocabulary around this. In the last 15 years, we have planted four daughter congregations, which collectively are reaching over 1,000 people 
in those four congregations. And over the course of the last 15 years have reached thousands and thousands of people. We're thrilled with that history. But we think God is calling us to a new frontier, a frontier of church reproduction called campus ministry. Campus ministry is different from church planting. In church planting, you start a new church that's autonomous and independent. It has its own elders, its own organization, its own a constitution and financial management and so forth. But with a campus ministry, a campus stays under the umbrella of the mother organization, so to speak. We love this phrase, one church, two locations. And we think God is calling us to a frontier where there might be many locations, where you still have a church that oversees any number of settings. So only one set of elders, one constitution, one financial management. And all of this that we've learned here over the 35 years of community church life, we want to export to new opportunities. We want to reproduce what we're learning in children's ministry and put that in other locations. We want to reproduce what we've learned in student ministries and put that in other locations and adult ministries and worship ministry so that people have the chance to experience authentic, compelling worship in the presence of God. And what we've learned in weekend service and preaching ministry, we can export to other contexts as well. It still stuns me whenever we do our membership class and we ask people, what is it about community church that had you uh, choose to affiliate here or to come here? What is it that intrigued you? And these days, by far, the number one answer is, well, we love being a part of this church because it teaches the Bible in a way that's real and practical. And I always think that is such a... That's such a strange answer because you would think that would be assumed in every church. But tragically, it's not. And so we want to take what we're learning here and make it available into new communities, new opportunities. We're dreaming about places like Lomira and maybe Chilton or Rosendale or Brownsville or beyond. We're trying to figure out how we can reproduce what God has taught us here and take it into new communities. Why? Because we want to be a movement of disciples radically committed to loving other people for the glory of God. We want to start a, a, another congregation somewhere that's real and safe and transformative for people to be authentic in the way they experience the truth of God's word. It's okay to be messy before God and one another. We don't only want to do it here in Fond du Lac, but we want to do it in new regions around us. This is just a snapshot of part of our strategic vision. Now here's what I need from you as you think and reflect on this. First, would you pray about joining this adventure? Will you make this vision your vision? Will you engage your efforts in prayer, asking God to give us strength and, and his truth and the ability to accomplish that which we cannot do on our own? Will you be a partner in prayer, praying that this would come true? Second, will you get involved more than ever we need more, more people using their gifts and investing being a part of things here if you've been attending for some time and you're not involved in any way and you've been waiting wondering would someone ever ask you to get involved i want you to consider yourself asked okay this is my personal invitation to you Find a place. If you can't find a place, I'll help you find a place. My staff will help you find a place. Some of you could help us in our children's ministry so we could export, you know, what we're learning. Some of you could help us in our small group ministry or our teaching or our youth. Please consider getting involved. Third, 
Will you support this vision with your resources? You have been so generous in the past. I'm, it's one of the things I love about you as a church. You get a challenge, you get a specific effort, and you always respond, always. And so I want you to know this is a new challenge. In order to do what we're talking about, we need to expand our budget. You're already meeting budget, and I'm so grateful for that. Thank you. But we need to go beyond that if we want to cross into new frontiers. In order to reach more people, we need consistent, generous givers. Not because you feel shamed or manipulated, but because you're invested because you have a wartime mentality, because you say, I believe that God has called me to play a part in this vision. Vision costs. It costs emotionally. It costs practically and relationally. We need everyone to get involved. We need everyone to own and be selfless. You see, we want this church and any number of churches to be a safe place where real people can come in their brokenness and discover the truth of God, that they're loved more profoundly than they've ever known, and experience his power through his spirit, the truth of his word, and be forever changed. We want a growing number of people to have that experience. Broken people need healing. Broken families need leadership and spiritual direction. Lost communities need hope and light. Will you make this your call? Will you own this as your challenge? That's what it means to be a part of this, your church. I'm giving my life to this cause. Will you? Let's pray together. God, we thank you that the great commandment and the great commission are clear. We thank you, God, for the history of those who have gone before us here in Community Church who have owned and invested and, and bought into the reality so that we might be at this point in this moment in the life of our church. Father, we cannot accomplish this vision apart from your spirit doing his work in the hearts and minds of surrendered people. So we ask you now to take these truths and teach us, convict us, equip us so that we might see a growing number of people discover life with you. Father, may we truly become a movement of disciples who are radically committed to loving others so that you will be glorified in our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.